Welcome to Human Centered, a series of short conversations with researchers at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. The center was founded in 1954 to encourage interdisciplinary research focused on the most pressing societal issues of our time. Each year, a range of scholars, scientists, and government officials come to spend a year studying contemporary societal problems. My name is John Markoff. I'm a science and technology writer and former reporter for the New York Times. In these conversations, we've set out to find interesting projects at the center that shed new light on the way we think about society. Today, I spoke with Margaret Levy, who is director of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. Margaret is a political scientist who specializes in comparative political economy, labor politics, and the theory of democracy. Let me start by asking you what led to the Moral Economy Project. What, what were the threads that sort of caused you to put it together? There were multiple threads in causing me to put together the, the Moral Political Economy Project. One is my own personal deep interests and in convictions and commitments. Um, so I'm a political economist, um, and I have thought hard and deep not only about labor issues, but also about the way in which capitalism has evolved over time, and that it's not just one thing, and that it changes. And because of my own concerns about what's going on politically in not just this country, but in the world, which I think is a reflection of a transformation, once again, in the cap both the capitalist system, and that then leads to strains with the kinds of institutional arrangements that we have to regulate our economic system. And so it seemed to me like a very good moment, um, and CASBIS is very well situated to take advantage of that moment to rethink or to think and generate new ideas about, um, or if, not necessarily new ideas, it might be consolidating some ideas that are already out there, if they are, okay. about how we, what the next big model of the political economy should look like. And I was thinking about in your, in your uh, think piece, the working paper, you traced this trajectory that was, you know, from laissez-faire to Keynesianism to neoliberalism, and sort of then the question, of course, is what's next? But I also then thought, well, how much does this have to do with American traditions versus European traditions? Because I, I, I began to wonder whether a lot of the sort of notion of a moral economy is, isn't sort of implied in the social democratic experience in Europe. Well, I think every, every, every economy has a moral piece to it. Every okay. economy, no matter where it is, yeah. has some set of values that are embedded within it that it's trying to achieve. The Chinese economy does, Chinese idea of an economy does, of a political economy. Um, the Swedish and Norwegian and you know the social democratic vision is different than uh, the neoliberal v vision. There were uh, contestations that happened after the Second World War about what the right model was, and there were at least three. There was the Soviet model, there was the sort of American, British, in fact, whole European model. And then there was this uh, model that came out of India that was thinking about being something in between the two. Uh, so, you know, there have always been... All, every single model ha is a mar so the the larger frame, the larger thing is called moral political economies mm -hmm. um, because we really do want to signal that there are multiple possibilities out there. But it seems with the you know the the ascendancy of neoliber neoliberalism in America that the notion of morality and economy it becomes implicit or it gets submerged, doesn't it? That's because right. Because there is this view that it's just this market, this sort of perfect thing. Well, it does be get submerged, but it didn't start off submerged. Yeah. Yeah. So if you think about um, von Hayek, who the road from serfdom, I mean, there's a whole set of values there about why he doesn't like big government and big certain kinds of big think, because it leads to fascism and to Nazism. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, Friedman's free to choose. I mean, those are the two big, big, big players in yeah. the creation of neoliberalism in terms of the thinkers. And free to choose is about putting on a pedestal one set of values as opposed to another set of values, yeah. right? Yeah. So yes, it then became implicit as if this is value-free, but in fact it never was value-free. Yeah. 
And Friedman <laughs> placed both sides of the fence on that one. Yeah. But I think if you, I mean, anybody who's looking at it um, objectively sees that there are values embedded in there, like there are in every political economy. Yeah. Before I go too far down that path, I, I, I wanted to sort of ask you to, to sort of see, to step back and say, how does this project fit into your, your vision of CASBIS and CASBIS role? Just sort of as a general, yeah. where is CASBIS going kind of question. So one of the things that I think CASBIS is uniquely or relatively uniquely um, capable of doing is to think beyond the short term and to think in terms of a much longer term. I'm not mean, I don't mean science fiction like a thousand years from now or even 150 years from now, but to think beyond the next five to 10 years to really think about the next generation, let's say. Um, and to think about that in ways that are informed by the best of social science and other thinking that's out there and bring those people together. We have a capacity to attract people who are those kinds of thinkers and to link it, that with other thinkers who are not necessarily academics or not just journalists like yourself, but futurists like Paul Sappho or people in um, Google uh, or you know YL who I was just having lunch with, you know, who come from um, different places and different ways of thinking about the question. So that we're all in it together to generate new research, the research that needs to be done use the best of the research that has exist, also generate the kind of thinking that leads to new research and leads to new policy practices. Okay. So no, I no. see all of our projects sort of have to meet those, the big, not necessarily every single workshop because those can have a very specific purpose for some finite end, but certainly anything that gets entitled a project and is supposed to be multi-year and ongoing should have those kinds of characteristics. Yeah. So I saw this one as exactly fitting within that framework. You picked um, technology as a theme, and I was also thinking about sort of you know in your in your first paper you talked about you know from the industrial revolution to the green Rev revolution. Was there is there a trajectory too? Was there a sort of a, a, a reason related to the theory why you picked technology as the focus point? Yeah, so it, that, the choice of technology, so this is one of the working groups that came out of the first meeting. So there was an earlier meeting in May um, that brought together about 20 or 25 people um, to, to think about where to go with this and how to do it. The model is really the Mont Pelerin Society in many ways, which was what the neoliberals did, was created by von Hayek and he was the first president and, and Friedman ultimately became the president of it. It was a group of economists who were opposed, what, what's, what brought them together was their opposition or critique of, of Keynesianism. Not necessarily that they had a clear vision, in fact they argued with each other like crazy. Um, they had somewhat different views, but it did lead to supply side economics and to neoclassical theory in, in its neoliberal variant. Yeah. Um, and there was a great book written um, by Angus Bergen called The Great Persuaders, right. which I read. Uh, partially, um, I believe it was recommended to me by Larry Kramer f from Hewlett Foundation, president of Hewlett Foundation, who was, at the same time I was thinking about this moral economy project and whether we should go forward with it, he was creating um, a whole area of program on beyond neoliberalism and wrote a wonderful think piece that you should read if you haven't, okay. or a projection that he sent to the board and then became the sort of guidelines for this. And part of our funding is coming from that project, yeah. from that Hewlett project. So the technology piece came out of that first meeting that we needed a series of working groups to take the ideas forward, and one of them was a focus on technology, and for several different reasons. One is for the reason you highlighted, that if you think about the history of capitalism, and therefore the history of the moral political economies that have been created to help regulate capitalism, or to help us know how to act within capitalism, um, the form of, the dominant form of capital is absolutely 
and the way in which work is organized and what the technology looks like is absolutely crucial. So you mentioned Leslie Fair, but you can go back before that and finance capital becomes very important, industrial capital before that is really important. So as these transformations in the way in which capital is organized and what constitutes the major productive mode um, change, so does, the mo so does the framework for dealing with it have to change. So technology is crucial to that, but it's also framing the way we think and how we interact. So it's crucial at another level as well, which was part of why the working group existed. I wonder, you know, your, your citing of sort of the roots of neoliberalism and how it sort of intentionally emerged is really interesting to me. And I was wondering, given that there's so much activity, intellectual activity around Silicon Valley now, around artificial intelligence and ethics, whether something might emerge from that. I mean, you know, that's happening on the industrial side, basically. Right. You're trying to bridge this. Right. Maybe you're just starting, but maybe that is a point at which you know, new ideas will come for the kinds of models that you're looking for might emerge from? Well, I'm hoping so. I mean, I, you, you will recall that we put in a proposal to uh, the initiative that Knight Foundation runs, manages, that comes out of Hoffman money and Amager money and others, um, to think about the ethics and governance of AI. And we framed it as within a moral political economy mm -hmm. framework. How do we think about these issues? And I think that that initial proposal helped propel my ideas and a few others of us. But it, it wasn't sufficient to respond to the questions that they are concerned about because we didn't have it figured out enough so that we didn't convince them that that was the right way to go yet. Or maybe yeah. they're just doing something else. Yeah, it doesn't right. matter. Yeah. At, but um, I think that is absolutely where we have to go. We, I mean, this has to be a framework that is in interaction with the people who are developing AI and other forms of technological change. It's AI isn't the, as you know, but as you have taught me, is not the only game in town here. Yeah. Um, One of the. Um you know, one of the things that's accompanied the rise of neoliberalism, one of the things that you've studied is the decline of unions. Right. And, you know, it came up a little bit during that workshop, and I, I, I wanted to sort of ask, you know, will unions come back or in this new model, or are there other ways of organizing people who work besides the conventional or traditional union movement? I think what has to come back is not necessarily unions, that may be um, a form of organization that was very much tied into a former, you know, another Economic. technology and another productive yeah. mode, um, but does have to come, we knew, do need intermediary associations that are being able to mobilize people and allow them to express voice and demands and articulate uh, their own values that are, um, that actually have a place in the society the way unions did. So right now we see a lot of forms of people organizing, but it's pretty, it, it, it's not to make concrete demands, it's to make diffuse demands. So we don't have a way of, of interacting with the political system right now between the voices of people who feel that they're being harmed and the political system. Yeah. And so finding intermediate Associations. This is this is another form of we've, we're now bowling alone. I mean, that's what some people. Yeah. I mean, that's how Putnam would put yeah. it. Yeah. But we need something that's so part of this model and this practice that we're developing has to be thinking about how do you give workers voice in this kind of world? Yeah. How do you give uh, people who are demanding certain human rights voice in this kind of world? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We've individuated it, or we've turned it into these really amorphous mass claimants. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Out of the working group process, do you see a path forward? What's the next step for the, um, for the Moral Economies Project? Well, I think there, there are a couple steps. One is um, the, my, my utopian ideal is that will actually generate something that replaces neoliberalism. I don't know what it'll be called. Um, maybe it'll be called Markovian. 
big new I ideas. Mean, <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. No. <laughs> but I mean, there might be someone amongst us who, you know, epitomizes a set writes a great book that epitomizes a set of ideas. I think in this world that's probably less likely than it's going to come out of some kind of collaborative effort and we'll have some kind of different name that'll epitomize what is critical about it. Um, it might be some new form of communitarian. I, I, I don't know, but yeah. that, would be, that would be the best outcome to actually generate something that is so, that catches people's imagination, actually speaks to the issues that have to be spoken to and gives people a path forward, both those who are in government and those who are in the economy and those who are in the more general civil society. Before that, yeah. <laughs> more more immediate steps would be a, very, a variety of white papers or books or articles that really express some of the thinking as it's emerging and developing in order to create a more uh, a better conversation. Yeah, you know, I remember now. I mean, not only was there the Port Huron statement, which was connected to the student movement, and actually sort of launched it, but later there was the Triple Revolution paper that came out of in response to automation. I mean, this was what in the early '60s, I yeah. believe, and so yeah. we're at that juncture. That's right. We? So we, we need, need those kinds yeah. of statements. Okay. So, which is which is far short of actually coming up with Keynesianism again yeah. or something else. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is good. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah. Thanks for chatting with us today. And for our listeners, take a look at the show notes for this episode for links to some of the topics and organizations we've discussed. <laughs>